<laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, the, hey, y'all. I'm Will Moyer. You may remember me from an hour ago. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a really cool clinical trial I'm doing um, called Ice Cap um, Influence of Cooling Duration on Efficacy in Cardiac Arrest Patients, Bayesian Adaptive Clinical Trial of Therapeutic Hypothermia. Um, and really is just a pleasure to be here today. So, oops, all right, let's see, next slide. Ah, somewhere, let's see if that works. All right, um, oops, so my disclosures have not changed in the last hour, I just checked, um, nothing, <laughs> nothing new, although I did, a, a supplement was submitted during this time period to the NIH. Um, all right. So I just want to acknowledge um, the ICECAP trial. It's something we've been working on for a while. Um, but the other principal investigators, Robert Silverglide at the University of Michigan, uh, Romer Geocaden, he's a neurocritical care doctor at um, Johns Hopkins. Sharon Yates, a biostatistician at MUSC. Um, Ramesh Ramakrishnan, uh, also a biostatistician at the Medical University of South Carolina. And, and, and Robert created many of these slides that we've used in some part to present to the NIH. Um, key collaborators from NIH and Berry Consultants are listed over there. And we recently held our investigator meeting in Tampa, and it was nice to, to get somewhere that was a little sunnier than Michigan. And you might recognize <laughs> those folks. So thank you. So um, this is an off-label use. People sometimes don't realize this. The devices we use for hypothermia are labeled by the FDA for temperature control, you can turn the knob down to hypothermia, but theoretically that's an off-label use. So I hold an IDE for ice cap, so I submitted a big thing of stuff to the FDA, and I am responsible for this. I'm not gonna get like anything really cool at the end other than we've learned something, um, but you know, is it possible some of the manufacturers of these devices could change their labels based on data from our study? It's actually not impossible, and that would probably be a good thing, potentially. Um, all right, so the title of this talk, Rebirth of the Cool, it's from an Afghan Wigs album from the early 1990s. Um, most people, this is a this band that started in Cincinnati where I grew up. It was it's a cool, cool band. You know, you can probably find them on Apple Music. If you don't know them, that, that's fine. You can listen to something else. Um, but this is, this is, you know, the rebirth of the cool. All right. So what are we going to try to do here in the next, I get like 50 minutes. Is that all right. And then like at some point lunch comes in and they're like, I'm not that interested anymore. So I have to like, <laughs> I have to be really interesting until lunch gets here. Is that, that, that's it. And then I have to be really, really interesting after lunch gets here. Okay. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the biological rationale for mild therapeutic hypothermia following global cerebral ischemia. I want you to become a little bit familiar with the concept of an adaptive clinical trial and what, what applications they have to medicine, because that's something that we, we maybe haven't seen a ton of. And then to understand somewhat the motivation for the ice cap design and contrast it with a, a typical or more traditional fixed trial in which the design, there aren't moving parts inside the design as it goes on. Um, all right, so we talked about ice cap, randomized, response adaptive. We'll get into what that means duration finding, comparative effectiveness clinical trial with blinded outcome assessment. So the idea here is we know to a large degree in the right patients, cooling a patient after cardiac arrest can increase the chances that they're going to wake up and have a good neurologic outcome. But we don't know exactly how long we should cool them. So um, the, you know, why is this an important question? You know, if we look at at what's going on in North America and the United States, you know, potentially about 200,000 patients have a shockable cardiac arrest each year. And if we look at the data pre the cooling trials, maybe about 25% of those people had a good outcome. Now, if we start to use hypothermia and, and, TT, and the TTM trial, we can get that up to about 50% of those patients may wake up and have a good outcome, which is, which is great, but there's still 50% of these patients who aren't having a good outcome. And perhaps some of them, the damage is too severe, we're, we're never gonna save. But it seems likely that maybe we could save more than 50% of these patients and help them out. But also, we have a bunch of patients who have non-shockable cardiac arrest, and we have way more uncertainty in them. 
the brain doesn't really care why your heart stopped. But prognostically, if, if a, a non shockable rhythm is the end result of a PE or some other end, end process, something bad was going on to the body for a longer period of time, as opposed to sudden cardiac arrest with a shockable rhythm, we're likely coronary blocked off, bam, person falls down. Prior to that, they were relatively healthy and intact. So you can see why easier to get better outcomes there in the non shockable cardiac arrest, harder to get the heart turned back on, but worse processes were leading to that heart stoppage beforehand. Um, used to be we had a lot of question marks here in terms of the non shockable cardiac arrest. Recently, there was one trial, Hyperion, that showed that patients with non shockable arrest benefit from hypothermia. Literally, like our grant says this, our protocol said this, like we would say this, there are no clinical trials in non-shockable cardiac arrest. And then like we're going to the DSMB like the next week and it's like asterisk. Okay, there's one small clinical trial that shows benefit in non-shockable cardiac arrest, but it wasn't enough to completely change practice. Guidelines had given it a lower level recommendation for some of the reasons we're talking about. The brain doesn't care if it protects the brain and it's good for the brain in shockable rhythms, it's probably good in non-shockable rhythms, they just have a different prognosis. Um, so what the idea of ice cap is, is can we improve the outcomes of the patients? And also, even amongst those 50% of people who have a quote unquote good outcome, how good is good, right? Like, I mean, I, I sort of look at this as like, if my job was to like suture up people and see people with chronic abdominal pain, I don't have to go to work and think that much when I'm doing that. Not, not to diminish those things, those are important things we do, but how about I'm looking at a stroke patient and I need to decide in the next five minutes whether I'm giving them TPA. That uses a different part of my brain. And my ability to get back to both of those domains of work is potentially gonna be different, but I might be lumped into this good category, right? Cause it's like, hey man, you can still suture, right? Like, but I wouldn't be able to do my job as I currently do it, right? I wouldn't be like, putting two conference calls on at once because I have too many things on my plate because you heard Sue talk about all the things I have on my plate while I'm riding my bike and um, et cetera. I wear a helmet, so you know, don't worry about me too much. But again, you know, what is a good outcome, right? Can we learn more about the neurocognitive outcomes in patients in a way that we can learn more about how well we should, you know, whether, whether cooling can help in other ways? So cardiac arrest is a cardiac emergency and a neurologic emergency. So that is, I think, one of the things that's really neat about the SIREN network, um, which previously was a neurologic emergencies treatment trials network. It moved on and has become um, both a emergency treatment network that's focused on neurologic emergencies, but also heart, lung, and blood emergencies. Um, previously, the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium was funded by the NIH Institute and NHLBI. So this, this, this new SIREN network is focused both on heart, lung, and blood emergencies and neurologic emergencies. So the fact that we've been planning ICECAP for some time made it a perfect way of sort of bridging cardiac emergencies and neurologic emergencies. Um, and also the, the other sort of joke I say is like, well, back at Michigan, my chair, Bill Barson, he was really into stroke research. And then, um, and then we got a new chair and he was really into cardiac arrest research as it turns out. Um, so it, it kind of worked, but again, my goal is to help identify and save neurons that could potentially die and keep them from dying. That, even though it's, it's, sort of, it's a little bit more tangential in the dizziness stuff, but again, it is like, I don't, you know, I don't wanna miss strokes. I'd like to make people better. But here, um, it's definitely a very clear, high stakes condition cardiac arrest. So the, um, when we do research on the brain, we have to think about what we know about the mechanisms of injury and things that can help reduce it. And when the, you know, there's like the, what I would sort of characterize is there's a sort of sixth grade health understanding of cardiac arrest and um, your brain injury. It's like if oxygen is cut off to your brain for more than a minute or two, something bad will happen, your brain cells will die. And the reality, as, we, as we, we know, is that it's more complicated than that. You know, if you have a reduction in flow to your brain, cells might die, they might be stunned. There's some of them that could recover if properly supported. So it's not surprising that things are more complicated than we learned in, in, in you know, middle school health class. But overall, once you 
identify that these are the mechanisms of injury, you know, people are doing a, have done a lot of animal models of things to try to reduce brain injury when brain cells are deprived of oxygen, you know, whether that's stroke, focal ischemia, cardiac arrest, global ischemia, or cell culture models, you know, they looked at basically thousands of experiments, 1,026 to be exact, and ranked how much neuroprotection was conferred by different things. And um, I'm colorblind. Whatever color that is there, that's hypothermia. It was, it, I think it's actually red. Is it red? Green? Yellow. Green? Anyway, it's supposed to be, I think it's a red dot over the other dots to turn it into greenish. Whatever, that's hypothermia. <laughs> I mean, it looks, I mean, I, I know the difference between a red light and a green light in, in, in traffic and stuff, but anyway. So high level of protection and the fact that that ball or that circle is bigger means more and more studied. And so this is one of the most studied and one of the most promising types of neuroprotective treatments. And again, I'm not going to go into, this is, this is the, the more, you know, it's complicated, you know, why the cells are dying, what the mechanisms are, when they're dying. But suffice it to say that if you were to develop a drug and you were like, I got this really cool drug, it stops MET K. That's great, but the cell's gonna find a different way to die, going one of these other ways. And the idea of hypothermia is that it actually slows down all of these things. And by slowing down all of these bad things that are leading to the cells dying, it makes the patient better. Um, now, that's not to say that there may be cocktails of drugs that could work, but I think in neuroprotection, definitely in stroke, we have not worked, we've not found, and in cardiac arrest as well, we've not found single agent solutions that actually improve outcomes or reduce neurologic da damage. So hypothermia represents a sort of blunt cocktail that is hitting multiple pathways and slowing down multiple pathways of cell death. You know, and, and the way I, and, the, and we know we know um, from a lot of both animal and human data that the worst thing that can happen to you after you have a brain injury, whether this is TBI, stroke, cardiac arrest, is for you to get a fever, right? Like I, as a child of the 80s, they had this public service video, like, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, and it was like a boiling egg. And that's sort of like, this is your brain when it's hyperthermic, right? Like the brain is cooking. So these cells, the way I say it, like these cells just haven't decided, right? They're like, I could die. If things are looking good though, maybe I won't die. Then there's a fever, they're like, forget it, right? Like, it is time to die. The cells just go doom, down to apoptosis, gliosis, game over. So that is one of the criticisms of some of the hypothermia trials. Is that, are we just preventing fever? And I think um, from the animal data, it's more than preventing fever. It's actually getting these processes slowed down. So this is um, a set of some selected trials of hypothermia following cardiac arrest. And what we're showing is the proportion of patients that had a favorable neurologic outcome in these studies. The, um, and the different temperatures that were used, the different targets that were used. TTM48 was a, small, a smaller study by Kierkegaard and colleagues where they compared 33 degrees for 48 hours to 33 degrees for 24 hours. As you can see, 48 was a little better. Um, and this was probably, this was a focus mainly on shockable rhythms, which is why things are that far over there with the good outcomes. Hyperion, the study I mentioned in non shockable rhythms, you see that this is the, you know, sort of, this looks the, you know, sort of the worst in terms of prognosis, but a big treatment effect between 33 and 37. FAPCA was a trial in pediatrics, and we actually are developing a pediatric ice cap trial to try to get at this question where 33 degrees was compared to normothermia, um, and you know, more patients did well with 33. You look at this and like, if my kid had a cardiac arrest, I would like them set the 33. But because of the sample size they had, the New England Journal of Medicine made them conclude there is no evidence that therapeutic hypothermia in children is more effective. Though. But I would sort of challenge you, like, that was your kid. They can turn the knob to 33 or turn it to 36.8. So it left residual uncertainty. TTM trial, which compared 33 and 36, it was done in Europe. It turned, you know, and cardiac arrest outcomes in Seattle often are really touted amongst North America as, as pretty good, right? People look at like Birmingham, like, boy, what are they doing there? But Seattle, 
things are good. In Europe, um, you know, we think that perhaps how severe your injury is is related to how much hypothermia might help. So in Europe, in the European study there, the median time to bystander CPR was like one minute. So that's not what I see even in Ann Arbor, maybe within the city of Ann Arbor, but within the city of Ann Arbor, everybody's healthy or wealthy or a college student. So there's just not that many cardiac arrests in Ann Arbor. But in North America in general, a median time to bystander CPR of one minute would be really good. Um, in Japan, I think they get there. They actually, I think when you get your driver's license in Japan, it's required that you actually take a CPR course. So there are a lot of countries that are way ahead of America in terms of getting people to do bystander CPR quickly. Um, again, obviously an important public health intervention. So, you know, there are these questions about, oh, there's a 33 versus 36 trial. Do we need to cool people at all? We need to cool people, but we can talk about that a little bit more. The older trials that really sort of set the stage for using hypothermia that came out in 2002, the Hopkins and Bernard trials, you know, again, there, here was the criticism of, gosh, was this just not, was this just keeping people from getting warm? So that's why, you know, that's what this trial was, was you know, working out to address. So this is what we know right now. So we'll take a brief interlude here to the idea of an adaptive clinical trial. And the word adaptive can mean different things. Um, in certain settings, you might be making ad adaptations within patient, like a adaptive regimen or a dynamic treatment regime or a smart design. Um, and this, in, in, in the adaptive clinical trial paradigm, what we're usually talking about is changing what's happening for future patients. We're changing how allocation is. For example, the NET network, one of the last trials it finished was the established status epilepticus trial, treatment trial. In patients who benzodiazepines didn't stop their seizures, we were comparing three things, randomized, blinded, by placebo, or no placebo because it was comparative effectiveness. If your seizures didn't stop with an adequate dose of benzodiazepines, was 60 milligrams per kilogram of levetiracetam versus, I think, 20 milligrams per kilogram of phosphenitoin or, phosphony, or phenytoin equivalents versus some dose of valproic acid, which I forgot. So comparing those three things, and bear in mind that that was a honking dose of levetiracetam, right? When people are like, hey, give a gram of levetiracetam. 60 milligrams per, per kilogram, that means like what? The, they're like, that's what you're giving your 20 kilogram person, you know, 25 kilogram person, you know, so 15 kilogram person. So anyway, so it went up to a max of 4.5 grams of levetiracetam in that study. Anyway, the design was in the background, whichever of those drugs was doing better, more patients got it as the trial went on. So there was this within, um, you know, a cross patient adaptation that your chances of getting the better drug went up over time in the trial or could, depending on what the data would show. And the benefit of having that adaptive um, aspect to it was if one of the drugs was a real dud, it would fall off quickly. So um, I'll get into, I think I have that actually in slides, so I'll get into that in a second. So this is a little bit of a um, idea of, this is a something, I don't know if you have these around here, stink bug, it's in Michigan. They don't even really smell that bad, but they're called stink bugs. Um, so, so oftentimes clinical trials stink, and I think sometimes we think of clinical trials as like this way of like, I know what the answer is, I just need to prove it so I can tell other people. And that's the wrong way to think of clinical trials, right? Clinical trial is really like a diagnostic test. So if you use this paradigm of a diagnostic test, we're trying to rule in a disease or rule out a disease. So a clinical trial is similar in that it's screening for effective treatments. That's what we're looking for. So in terms of the you know, type two error, if there is an effect, can we see it, the power, or the type one error, making a false positive, basically. You know, this, these, you know, it's a significance level and power of a clinical trial, but basically, you know, the false positive rate of a diagnostic test or the sensitivity of a test. And when we design clinical trials, we make a ton of assumptions. We believe the dose from animal models is close. We believe there's no heterogeneity of effect in that, you know, maybe milder patients do better than with a treatment than more severe patients. And that's a little bit different than prognosis, right? Like it is, it's related to prognosis. Like if a patient has a bad prognosis, they're not gonna have as much of a benefit. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. You know, subgroups are, are equally, you know, response. Sometimes we just leave people off. Like let's not study old people because old people do bad. Um, you know, for the TPA trials and stroke, that was the European approach. Again, 
nothing against Europe, but they felt that the prognosis of older adults was so bad. So when they designed their TPA studies, they said, we're only including up to age 80. And that was fine, but it led to their, when they have their, had their sort of drug approval in Europe, the drugs uh, there only use TPA in 18 to 80. Whereas in America, they're like, we don't care how old you are, you know? Because if, if people, most of us, at, at some point, if we've been, you know, if, if we, we talk to like our grandparents or stuff like that, they'd be like, hey, do whatever you can to keep me from being disabled. So there's a you know, potential benefit of using the drug in those folks if you can help them maintain their in, independence. So that was, again, in Europe, they made one decision, like we don't want to include people over 80, led to problems later because what do you do after that study is done? They didn't, they didn't see patients there. In the United States study, we didn't put an upper limit. You could also say that maybe there weren't as, not, as many people as you would like to see in the study who were older, and that's certainly true, um, but it, they weren't excluded. Um, sometimes we just come up with an effect size so that we can get a sample size, like, we're like oh, reducing mortality by 10% would be good. And you're like, hmm, why do, why do we pick 10%? Um, and we want to make sure that the duration of treatment is practical. We did a study of progesterone after traumatic brain injury, and we treated people for three days. But there were animal models that said five or seven days was even better, but it's hard, right? Like after TBI, patients are going to rehab and things like that. We can't keep giving them an IV infusion for seven days. So we made this, you know, we, we made this decision that we would just treat them for three days. And then the, you know, phase three trial was neutral. So it's a regret. You can't go back there and say, oh, wait, 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 wait. Can we do seven days now? Like nobody's really interested in funding it anymore. So it, it's you getting these things wrong up front can be a problem. So you do have to make some assumptions, um, but what you are trying to really find in a clinical trial is something like this, a therapeutic response service. And this is a, a commentary from Lewis Shiner from UCSF. And the, this idea is that for any treatment, you know, there are prognostic factors within an individual patient and that there is this function, this unknown function, this underlying biology. We don't know what this is, but within a clinical trial, we're partially trying to estimate this. Which treatment regimen in patients with which prognostic factors will elicit this much benefit? And definitely it goes down this way to harm, right? There are some treatments that if you pick them, if you give them in the wrong times with the wrong prognostic factors, too high a dose, it's gonna start harming people. Sometimes this thing could be totally flat. There is no subset of patients who benefit from the treatment because it's a null treatment. Um, but this is, you know, this is what we're trying to do. And then when we're out in practice later, what we've learned in these clinical trials is that we're trying to treat some patient who has this combination of prognostic factors, we give them some regimen, and then we hope that they would see the uh, somewhere near the benefit we, we could expect from the clinical trial. Knowing that there's noise, patients in clinical trials are often different from patients, not in clinical trials, et cetera. And you know, similarly, we can learn about mechanism or theory for behavioral interventions, targets, you know, move to translational research, and then start to move into clinical trials, which potentially are dose ranging early, safety, feasibility, and cost, and, and other early phase trials. And then in like a phase three trial, at least in drugs, efficacy. If treated, do patients get better under the circumstances defined in the study? And then there's also effectiveness, right? In the real world, in a population that's likely to be seen, is it still effective? And I think sometimes we get a little mixed up as to which of these we should be doing, but typically you do want to show this because it would be hard, it's harder to show this because there's more noise. Not to say it's not important to show this, but if you can't prove it works in anyone, it's hard to say that you need to jump right to that. And I think with a, a lot of pressure to be more efficient with clinical trials these days, there is a push to try to do effectiveness research a little bit too early. I think, and that's, I'm not saying it's not important, but I think you have to find things that work first. Um, if they work in, you know, they're not gonna work in, you know, either you have to have tons and tons of patients to overcome noise, or, which is usually not popular, or in a smaller subset of patients, find things that work really well. So in terms of addressing the fact that you might have a few areas of uncertainty, maybe you don't know what the dose should be, Maybe you want to, you know, you want to pick three drugs, right? Like in our ESET trial, we had three drugs we liked. A lot of times, if you if you were to go to a statistician, they'd be like, "Yeah, can't you do some more research and figure out which of those two you really like?" Because the statistical methods they're used to using 
are conditioned on comparing two things. But we sort of said, no, no, we really do like all three of these things. We need a method where we're going to look at these three things. So in an adaptive trial, you begin data collection with initial allocation and sampling rules. And this means like, I'm going to allocate these people to these doses. And in ICECAP, you know, we'll talk about that. Those are durations. Then in the background, unbeknownst to the investigators, the data that has accrued will be analyzed. And if a stopping rule is met, like if the study gets an answer or the study is never going to get to an answer, then the trial stops. However, if the rule is not met, you might change where the next patients go. And then you continue data collection until you rule, you know, one of the stopping rules might be, I'm enrolling a maximum of 1,800 patients. And that would be certainly reasonable. So then, you know, this is, you know, the adaptive trial is you create an algorithm and then the data from the trial helps you, um, the data from the trial defines where you walk down that algorithm. The other child of the 80s type reference here is like a choose your own adventure book. You basically have to write the whole book for what the trial is going to do beforehand and publish it. So it knows that people aren't making these decisions based on data because people often make bad decisions when faced with data. You have an algorithm that sort of draws the map that if this, it's going to do this. Sometimes people make good decisions, but usually um, with, with, with data, it's better to sort of program it because you can understand how it's going to work better. So by using an adaptive design, your goal is the design of a trial that leaves no or few regrets in that there's not going to be, we're, we're hoping there's not going to be an ice cap too, right? It's like, oh man. I mean, in that case, if, 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 think, if 72 wins and we didn't include any durations longer than that, then we're going to be really sad, right? We're going to be like, Oh man, 96 might have been better. We didn't program that duration in. So then, then we would have to do IceCap2, and you can all, I'll come back and you can like throw tomatoes at me when I'm talking about IceCap2. But we're hoping that the design allows us to think about what are the things that could happen in the trial, and is it going to address the things that would make us sad if they happened? Because sometimes we talk to people who are designing trials, and we're like, hey, if your drug doesn't work, what would you do? I was like, they'd be like, hey, how sure are you of the dose for this? I'm like, I'm really sure. This is like the right dose. It's like, oh, okay, great. So if your trial was completely neutral, what would you do next? It's like, I'd give patients a bigger dose. I'm like, you weren't really sure, right? Like, like you know, why don't we do that right now, right? If you feel a, new do a higher dose would be safer, let's learn about a few doses. It's like, it's like, I will only go do the higher dose if the initial trial fails. It's like, there might be a good reason for that, but there often isn't. So, so sometimes it's a matter of like, what would you do if your trial was negative, the pre-mortem? It's also important to know that these aren't magic and that an adaptive or flexible design does not always make sense. So we don't usually know as much before starting a trial as we do after we have the data for most situations. So again, some things, particularly if there's a long time to onset, there's not a lot of you know, movement that you can make. If you're not getting information, it's hard to make it's hard for the trial to make changes to work better. So if it's like a long, if you're trying to see if, you know, you give people aspirin today and 20 years later, are they going to have cancer? It's hard to adapt on that because you don't get your outcome for 20 years. So again, they don't always make sense. They don't always reduce the sample size. The idea is that they can help you answer questions better. Um, so, but they're more complicated and they require more upfront work because the algorithm, because if it's like, I'm going to compare this mean blood pressure to this mean blood pressure, you can say exactly how many patients you need to detect this difference in blood pressure. But if the trial can start doing things and changing how many patients go into which arm, then it gets a little bit more complicated. So you have to simulate the trials using numerical simulation to see how that machine works. And you stress test that machine under different assumed truths. You say like, if all the drugs are the same, all the durations are the same, how often does the trial come out positive. And you do this and you tweak the design, turn the knobs to make the design work well. So we had the opportunity through the Adaptive Project to work on this FDA NIH cooperative award that, that Michigan was the prime site for to actually design adaptive trials. At this time in our network, um, this was around 2010, we were designing trials kind of the old fashioned way. And we got in touch with the group from Barry Consultants and, the, and Roger Lewis at, at, at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and built this grant to design five new adaptive, well, four new adaptive trials. The ESET trial, which was recently completed, the established status epileptics trial, was one of the trials we designed. 
And ICECAP was one of the trials that was designed. So again, not to dissuade any of you from a career in research, um, but we had the initial, ICECAP had been planned even before this, at some level, it was called something else. But I went to Washington DC for our first planning meeting um, for ICECAP in July of 2011. I just finished, I had just been FDR in the musical Annie. And I went right from the cast party to a 10 p.m. flight from you know, Detroit to, to DC. And the, um, you know, that was when we had our kickoff meeting for it. We were planning ESET, a trial that we had finished at exactly the same time. The reasons that it's taken so long to get this trial off the ground are sort of not important. I could tell you later, whatever. But if, if ICECAP was a trial, if ICECAP was one of my children, it would be my middle kid, right? I have two older kids and two younger kids than ICECAP. Like I have a 13 year old, 11 year old, ice caps, you know, my um, you know, nine year old, I have an eight year old and a four year old. So ice caps kind of, I don't have a true middle kid, right? I have like the upper middle, lower middle. So ice cap is my middle kid really. Um, so it, the, 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 the story to that is sometimes it takes a while to get things done in research and that's okay. You have to be able to be patient and work on a extended sort of time cycle. Um, we wrote some papers about this, it, it, these were sort of like an, anthropology type papers where we looked at how biostatisticians, clinicians, regulators, people from NIH actually got together and figured out how to design these trials. And we actually were so good at designing the trials, we, we made a couple extra. So one was a sort of split. We had two ways of doing a glycemic control trial, which also has finished. Um, the other trials, so the two other trials that we designed we designed a hypothermia and spinal cord injury trial, which we submitted a couple of times, has not got funded yet, although it could still come back. We still would like to do it. And then we designed a trial for progesterone and stroke. The progesterone and stroke trial um, died when the progesterone and TBI study was so neutral that everybody really is like, we don't like progesterone anymore, which is too bad. Um, oh, does anybody have a power cord or did I knock the power cord off? Because basically the talk apparently is going to end. Um, I hope that's Madeline. Oh, I just noticed that your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a power outlet. It looks like it's got the USB-C if anybody has a USB-C. Oh wait, it's not going to, there's a couple things going on it, right? We're gonna lose something. We can't lose, <laughs> we don't wanna lose that, right? What's this? Is this the, this is the mouse. I don't need a mouse. Let's. I need. I need. I think that'll. Then I, I will no longer click. Right, the click isn't going to work anymore. That's fine. I'll press the button. All right. Okay. All right. Good. Our Mac will not shut down soon. All right, so I mean, it would have really been a shame if I finished before I could talk about why we chose the ice cap design. All right, so what we were looking at in terms of the objectives, right? Can longer durations of hypothermia improve patient outcomes? And can we confirm the efficacy of hypothermia by evaluating duration response, right? So if we're looking at multiple durations of hypothermia, if a longer duration is better than the shorter durations, then hypothermia works, and the FDA accepts this. There's no no cooling group in our study because we didn't feel that that was ethical. The third aim is can the quality and safety of recovery be different among patients who are cooled longer? And we're looking at this separately in people with shockable rhythms versus people with non-shockable rhythms. Our idea is that the answer may not be the same. If people with non-shockable rhythms are more severely damaged in the brain, maybe they need to be cooled longer or maybe they need to be cooled shorter. But the design is flexible, and it's fit finding a different answer for each of those subpopulations. Here are uh, some of the uh, initial 50 sites that went in with our grant application. I think I mostly got it in the right place. Um, sometimes the maps aren't lined up. Yes? Chris, do you uh, sort of sense that like, uh, the wave is cooling from the catheter that's sort of like embedded in the cord, that it's yeah, so you have to use a definitive control device that has a sensor that goes into the patient to servo control the temperature, but endovascular devices and um, surface cooling devices are both permissible in the trial design. We will track which type you use, but 
we don't tell you which type you have to use. From the whole list of currently approved devices, so my IDE with the FDA includes all currently approved devices. Does that make sense? All right, so the general design overview, what we're, what we're doing. Initially, we're allocating the patients to 12, 24, 48 hours. Then, after we observe the first 150 patients or so, we're going to adapt independently what the allocation ratio is. And the idea here is, if the curve is flat, if longer durations aren't helping more, it's gonna look earlier. It can go down to six hours, which is very short. But that's this idea that, you know, maybe we just need to do TTM. Maybe we don't need 33 degrees. It will go that way. If the curve is positive or upsloping, it's gonna start looking later, right? It could look at 60 hours. In both cases, it needs a pretty strong evidence that 12, you know, that, that it's flat before it opens six, because we don't want it to open up six willy-nilly, right? So this is one of the things, when you build the design, you have to sort of temper the computer. If a pure computer was trying to figure this problem out, it would want to put a bunch of people on six and 72, because then you can see like, oh, look, big line. The biggest way to see the line would be move people there. Ethically speaking, though, we don't want a bunch of people on six and 72 if those aren't the right places. We're looking for a plateau. If the plateau is around 48 and we put a bunch of people on 72, we'll be sad that we expose all those people to extra hypothermia. Similarly, if the right answer is 24 and we put a bunch of people on six just to prove a point, we'll be sad that those people weren't exposed to the benefit. So the trial has this sort of dual um, charge of not only answering the question, but trying to do the best thing for the patients within the trial. And when you make an adaptive design and you're turning those knobs, there is a balance between how much are you learning, you know, efficiency of learning versus, you know, what you're, is what you're doing good for the patients. And in this space where, where cooling is assumed, the duration is what we're finding, you know, we put those constraints on. And this was like when we tweak the design, we, we you know, turn the knobs, turn the knobs a little bit, say, look, we don't like what that trial is doing. We need to have a harder rule so it doesn't start looking at six and 72 right away. And it was, you know, it wasn't easy, but it was, it was, it was feasible to program it so it would do those things. We, um, patient has to be comatose. The, the operational definition of coma is they're not following commands. So you're not thinking of extubating them, basically. Um, they have to be 18, at least currently. And then this is the tough one. You do have to get them to 34 degrees within 240 minutes of the time of the 911 call. This is a aggressive um, but doable target. And the reason here, and there's been some, you know, there's obviously some discussion that when somebody's brain is cooked, like their hypothalamus is completely messed up, it's easier to cool them, right? Their temperature just drops. And as we sort of joke, like, in Michigan, people are like pretty cold to begin with, particularly in the winter. So like, it's not too hard to get under 34. You just leave the doors of the ambulance open. But the, the idea here is this is a sense of very, this is a, this is a source of very potential variability in the trial. And by controlling it, by saying all the people who get in the trial have to be cooled early, that means that there's less of an impact on us looking at our treatment effect downstream. Now, um, again, it's, you know, it, it has its challenges. It's, we, we came up with this through a lot of, of soul searching, but that's, you know, that's how we're, that's how the study is going. And there, we have, we have our reasons for it. The other sort of key thing that is a little bit hard, but I think is very important is we really, the key message is we really don't, you know, based on your exam in the emergency department, we do not know what your neurologic prognosis is. And the AHA guidelines and, you know, AAN, you know, neurologic guidelines, are that you really can't know until at least 72 hours. So the idea here is that you want to make sure that the patients who are coming into this trial, there is an intent to maintain life support for 96 hours. This is hard, right? And like, Because people are going to be like, well, I think my family member is going to start waking up at 48 hours or 72 hours. So at 72 hours, I think I'm going to want to pull the plug. Then they you know, shouldn't be in our study. But I think they need to be disabused of the notion that anybody can tell too early. And you certainly can't tell while they're still cold. So this is a, you know, again, this is an innovative inclusion criteria, but quite important because if people get into the trial, but somebody is going to convince them all to have withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment on day two, then the study is not going to be able to learn because those observations are going to be uninformative. So Families can change their mind, but 
the goal here is upfront educating the families in that they shouldn't change the mind until sufficient data has been gathered. Key distinction here is if somebody is in florid cardiogenic shock and multi organ failure, and that you know, and it's felt to be futile for other medical reasons earlier than 96 hours, certainly a family making a decision that setting is is okay. And we can't control what clinical care happens afterwards. We want to make sure up front that the patients who are coming into the trial, people are willing to understand that you can't tell their neurologic prognosis on day one, on day two, on day three. You have to take people through that sort of vision that you can't tell. Um, I guess like I'll go, you, not the 10 yet, right? Like, I mean, I'll go on the little rant like about this, you can't tell the neurologic prognosis. So I was working on Super Bowl Sunday and um, not me, but a, a pay, a, the, the attending who was working next to me, we were in this not so acute area, like the chronic abdominal pain unit in our emergency department. And a, a young woman with kind of squirrely back pain was seen and she went home and she went into cardiac arrest, which is sad. Um, she was brought back to our emergency department and um, I, I heard of this story because that's really, that would be like one of the worst days I've had at the office basically really bad, right? And I, I wasn't really involved in anything other than I saw a bunch of our residents, they were hunched around a computer, looking at her head CT scan, and they were saying, man, she's posturing, look at all this cerebral edema, you know, she is screwed. And I just looked at them all, and I said, y'all need to shut up, right? Like, you don't know anything about, what, that's, that's a 30-year-old's head CT, right? You're used to looking at 80-year-old's head CTs. There's just brain in there because she's 30. Like, and the reason the radiologist wrote diffuse cerebral edema is because you wrote cardiac arrest on the indication. You all need to just shut up and just don't say that. And they all just looked at me like, what the hell's the matter with you, right? Like, you're, I'm not, they were working in the non-chronic abdominal pain unit, right? They were seeing more exciting patients. I just like stormed off. I was like, whatever. So then like six months later, <laughs> my wife is sitting next to this woman at gymnastics practice and she's fine as it turns out. Um, but she's mentioning how, hey, you know, I went to the U of M ER, like on, on a, you know, Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, yeah, they, like they sent me home and then I had a cardiac arrest. And Liz was like thinking to herself, it's like, my husband was working on that day. I wonder if he did that. And then she, you know, came and talked to me. I was like, Liz, you know, we have a good marriage. <laughs> I was like, well, Liz, that would have been like the worst day of my life. Like, like that would have been a really bad thing to have happen. I mean, not the worst, but like pretty bad. That would have been something I would have shared with you. But I did know that that happened. And I'm like really glad to hear that she's, she's doing quite well. So she had a myocardial bridge and that was what had sent her into cardiac. It's like when the muscle is like grown over and into the coronary artery. She's, she's fine and actually she's a supportive of, of the trial um, with, with that. But if I could just impress upon everybody is when you have a patient in the emergency department after cardiac arrest, you don't know what their neurologic prognosis is going to be. You don't know, you don't know, you don't know. So I would say just, just cool it on that. Um, yeah. One small thing. So, in case it wasn't super clear, you all are going to be a part of this trial. Um, and, and that 240 minutes is what we're going to need. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so, helping us identify patients who is getting the right care on the patient is faster than the other one. Uh, we're at about five and a half minutes, but it's actually pretty good uh, to get your goal at 33. Um, so, and you don't need to be all the way to 33. You just need to be under 34, so on the way to 33 with the dependent device on. We are measuring time 34 as of now, but I think we're pretty close already. We're going to have to just dig into the disclosure of how fast we are able to do that. There is um, a case in cardiac arrest that we don't want to go on a very broad question like this, but I had a patient who was PDA, so it's been rock in the field, and then she had this time to spend that balance. Yeah, so so that's a good question. Um, Scott Weingart brought that up with us um, just by email yesterday. So if this isn't somebody you would be cooling to begin with, then they're not eligible for ice cap because ice cap only patients who have been cooled are eligible for ice cap. So if you wouldn't cool the patient, then they're not in. I don't think I would cool that patient because of the bleeding diathesis. So if it's not somebody you'd be cooling now, don't do it. The thing we don't want to be is like, Oh, they just had like a what appears to be a regular old cardiac arrest, and it's like, oh, their hemoglobin dropped a point. Oh my God, let's turn the temperature up to 36. Like that, like 
that's foolishness. Like, don't, don't do that. But like, INR of 10 and GI bleed, I wouldn't cool that person. What would you look like if you hurt your, your left leg? Like, <clears throat> And we are are and they're eligible for the trial, right? If it's if it's good for the it's good for the mom, it's good for the baby. So FDA has changed or is in the process of changing their guidance on it. So that's why it's crossed off. Like when we initially designed the study, it was crossed off, but it's no longer crossed off. Right. What do you mean by prolonged downtime? Something somebody you wouldn't cool currently because they were I guess Abraham Lincoln, he's got a prolonged downtime okay. since like 1865. It, it, it's just more a matter of like somebody who you wouldn't be pursuing aggressive ICU care in based on the cardiac cardiac arrest. I should probably take that one off. I don't think that is actually in the protocol. I find a new typo each time I do this. Sorry. Prisoners we don't include because you have to ask the um, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for permission. And I hear he's like kind of busy right now. Um, so it's also a big pain. So th that's it. Presume sepsis is the etiology of arrest. That's another one. All right, other questions? These are good questions. We, so we don't specifically exclude it, but if, if they were thought to, if it was thought to be the end results of hemorrhage, I wouldn't do it. But like, we, there's certain hangings and things like maybe drownings that where we wouldn't want to, or, or there's the, you know, the favorite, like someone driving in their car, slow speed, bonk, and then they come in as a trauma but really they had a cardiac arrest and their car ran into the curb. So because of that, like they're going to quickly kind of be signed off on a trauma that they didn't arrest because of the trauma. So, so that you don't have to sort of sort that out. Like, well, they wreck, they wreck their car. We just haven't put it on there. But typically if somebody has a arrest due to trauma, due to hemorrhage, yeah, no. Good question. All right. Um, primary outcomes of modified Rankin. Um, and this is, you know, a stroke outcome, but it functional outcome incorporating mortality. Um, it's assessed by blinded assessors. So when you're doing research, if your outcome of measure has some subjectivity to it, making sure that people don't know what was the treatment given helps improve the rigor and, you know, the, the sort of validity of your research. Um, very quickly, this is a sort of talking about how the study can expand, open up more time windows. Um, it has, you know, some time windows in between, you know, again, again, first on these three, then it can fill in in the middle and start to expand outward if necessary. Um, we change our adaptive randomization vector every four weeks when we're enrolling. We use a weighting of the modified Rankin scale. Um, again, we could talk about this for hours, but I think you're probably going to have lunch soon. It's not here yet. Okay. Um, we won't talk about it for hours. Um, so the other thing that's hard is right, we're finding a duration response curve. So a lot of times people are like, well, what's the power? What treatment effect can you detect? You know, in group A versus group B. Well, we have a bunch of these groups. And the idea here is the modified ranking of zero is good, the modified ranking of six is dead. And in each of these groups, with longer duration, this is one scenario that we tested in our adaptive algorithm, so that you know there's a plateau at 30, and you know we make simulated patients from that distribution, and this is an example of it, right? This is how this trial might go. It puts the first set of patients in shockable and non-shockable on 12, 24, and 48, and the hollow dots are what was observed in those patients. And the solid dots represent a inverted U-shaped model that is being used to describe the data. The reason we use inverted U is we think that perhaps longer durations could be harmful so that the model, this isn't a linear model, it's a flexible model that has a place where it goes up, a place where it goes flat, and a place where it goes down. It's flexible, so the whole thing could be flat, the whole thing could be up, the whole thing could be, or what I like to call the terminator scenario, the whole thing goes down, if that's the case, increasing durations of cooling are increasingly harmful. We don't want to see that. If we do see that, the trial will actually shut down early, but that's really the only case. And then these are like the randomization vectors. Now that it's seen these patients, it's deciding that for shockable rhythms, it wants to put the next set of patients here around 18. For non-shockable, 
it wants to, it's a little bit less sure, right? This is a little bit more narrowly upsloping. So it wants to put people here in the middle between 24 and 48. And that, those gray bars represent how many people have been put on those rhythms so far, or those durations in those rhythms so far. And then you check, you get some more, so we get some more information. It's noisy, because you don't have that many patients on 18, but the model's like, ah, I don't buy it. So it's basically averaging through that based on the, you know, sort of a smoothing function. Um, but it's learned more here. It looks kind of flat over here, so it wants to put more here. It doesn't have a ton of information, but it's, you know, here it's, it's flattened out, so it wants to look farther over than it did last time. And then just keeps iterating through that as it goes on through the trial and decide where to put those patients. And you can see that the, the shockable and non-shockable are making different decisions. And here at the end, it's actually put most of the people by the beginning of this plateau, and it's, it's fit this line. And here, it's moved people around. It starts to see things going down maybe on sparse data at 72, so it hasn't put too many people there. But it's, it's used this algorithm to decide where those patients should go. Um, and you, know, you can see what the model is estimating is the treatment effect at each of these sites clear upslope in both cases and you know the idea is this is what it found in this example trial well what was the distribution that we came up with those simulated patients from and it looked like this was the distribution that that, that, that they came from so very closely models the the distribution so when you simulate these trials you give it these sets of truths and say does the design do the right thing on there in this case in this example trial it did when you repeat that thousands of times you can figure out how often did the trial get the right answer. So if, the, you know, if this was the effect, the trial is finding that upslope, um, you know, is it 90% of the time? You know, plateau at 18 hours is harder than a plateau at 30 hours because it's closer to the end, there's less information. So this was the you know, evidence of positive dose response, and then did you pick the right duration? You know, it's harder to find the beginning of the plateau than to find the upslope. So there's a little bit less power to find the, the positive duration, but we picked the sample size of 1,800. We had about 80% power for our reference case. So in conclusion, there is strong potential impact of ice cap based on rich preclinical evidence. The adaptive designs have great promise to better answer many clinical trial questions. And hopefully ice cap is gonna deliver answers that will um, change clinical care. So, oh look, there it is, lunch. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. That's um, your, when you, so you're looking at a 90 day outcome. You're changing the hours between the two sets of results. How did you fit that on that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Like there might be a significant one out that you might want that is a great question. So we also will be collecting their modified ranking at four weeks. I think it's either four or six. I always get it wrong. It, it, I think it's, 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 it's six, four or six weeks. So we do that by telephone. And that is a placeholder for what their final outcome will be. It's predictive, right? If their modified ranking is zero and they're in perfect shape, pretty predictive that at 90 days, it's gonna be good. The modified ranking is six and they're dead, really predictive that at, at 12 weeks, they're still gonna be dead. Um, in between, the way the model works is it takes into account uncertainty. People with a modified ranking of three, maybe they're on a recovery slope, right, and they're going to look better. So it weights all of those partial observations a little differently, but uses them as placeholders in people who haven't yet achieved the 90-day outcome. So we use some partial information that comes in earlier. So after we've accrued 150 patients, we expect, you know, maybe 30 will have 90-day outcomes, and maybe you know, 50 will have the, you know, six week outcomes and so forth. So we would start to make decisions based on the partial information at that point. And then as those patients, the data matures, more patients have 90 day outcomes and so forth. And the model that's used to do the prediction in between gets better and better as the study goes on. We have a little bit of a pre-specification of it, but it's pretty vague to start. And as you learn more about the relationship, and it's purely being used to help drive where the patients are allocated it's not being used to quote unquote make predictions, so to speak. Yeah, so as with any trial, if you have missing outcome data, you lose power. 
Um, if, the missing, if the missing outcome data is due to informative missingness, like people who do good are more likely to be missing, then that is a problem. In the NET and SIREN trials, our teams have gone to great lengths to track people down, like three contacts and so forth. And even if they can get a partial, if they can get somebody on the phone and be like, dude, are you back to your usual activities? They're like, yeah, okay. Like, I mean, there's a little bit more to asking the modified ranking. There's a couple other questions, but if we have to, we can get outcomes by phone, so forth. So the, the other thing is the site doesn't get their second payment for the patient enrollment if they don't get the outcome. So sites are incentivized to try to get it. If you get the six week phone call though, the prediction of what the 12 week outcome will be can be used in the sort of missing data model. Basically when you use a Bayesian analysis like this, it does like multiple imputation on the fly. So it takes into account partial information on people who have, who have missing data. If somebody is missing at six and 12 weeks, then basically a mean value is put in and there, that observation is non-informative. Good question. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you.